This is Tree Phenology Analysis with R, a module at the University of Bonn in Germany. My name is Eike Lüdeling and I'm teaching this class and I want to talk about climate change today. This is already the fourth time I'm doing that. The first time I talked about the drivers of climate change, then about the warming and the rainfall changes we've already seen. Then I talked about future scenarios in the third lesson and this fourth one now is about impact projection approaches. So basically the question now is, well, we now have future scenarios of rainfall, of temperature, maybe of carbon dioxide concentrations. What does it actually mean for our biological systems and for our agricultural systems? The learning goals for today are that I want us to gain a rough understanding of the different approaches to projecting climate change impacts. I want you to learn about statistical models, about species distribution models, which are also kind of statistical models, uh, about process-based models and about so-called climate analog analysis. You should understand some of the advantages and drawbacks of these approaches. Now, what are impact projections? Well, we've already seen how we can produce scenarios of future climates. That was complicated enough, but of course, this now only gives us the projected climate change or the projected climates of the future. It doesn't actually tell us tell us how the system how our systems will respond. So how can we tell what these responses will look like? The first category of models that we have available to us is so-called statistical models. We've all used most of us will have used some statistical models. These are well regression approaches and some sort of trend analyses. Basically it's it's, it's the um, establishment of a relationship between climate parameters and an impact measure, for example, the crop yield. So here's a somewhat famous study by Lobel and Field from 2007, environmental research letters. These are basically um, the yield anomalies of wheat and rice and maize in different parts of the world at different time periods related to uh, the minimum temperature, the maximum temperature, and the rainfall. These points are really all over the place, but still somehow they managed to find a statistically statistical correlation here and use that to detect the impact that climate change has had on crop yields. So they've used it to explain past trends and also to project a future climate impacts. There's a lot of points here all over the place, but somehow <laughs> that still uh, was uh, successful in this case and was uh, widely recognized by the scientific community. There's a certain type of statistical model that is also finding a lot of applications these days. And this is something that everyone, um, while well, working on climate change to any, with, with any, well, level of depth in agriculture, at least, will probably come across uh, at some point. And that's so-called species distribution models or ecological niche models. Basically here, we're once again establishing a relationship between climatic parameters uh, and something related to biology, but in this case, it's the presence or absence of a species or a particular cropping system or something. So basically, we look at the distribution of a plant or an animal um, and look at the weather there, uh, the climate there, and then find, try and find a correlation, a relationship between these, um, uh, these two factors. We then use this relationship to project the future distributions of the same species. So here's an illustration of this. So basically you have here a, uh, a map in this uh, diagram with the dots here. So these, all these dots represent locations where we've observed a particular species. We then have layers here of, well, the geography, maybe the uh, the rainfall, a rainfall map or some sort of roughness map or whatever it may be, southness, uh, yeah, there's different factors that we can use. I mean, quite often, of course, we have climate data layers here. We then uh, characterize the um, distribution. Basically, we make a, well, this is only three dimensions here. It could, have, could be more dimensions, but then you can't really see it anymore. Basically, we characterize the conditions that we find the species in, and that then allows us to make a model and well, map their predictions um, well across the the, um, the environments we currently have, but also also for future environments. There are various tools to do this. Max and maximum entropy is is a very commonly used one. 
but there are also bioclimatic envelopes and boosted regression trees and a bunch of other algorithms that, that you can find in the literature. Um, the results, unfortunately, often differ dramatically between different algorithms, which is quite important to know. And e that is why even here, and we've already heard about ensemble models when it comes to climate scenarios, but in this particular field, it's actually been somewhat common to use, um, well, ap approach and methods ensembles here, where you don't only use one approach to, to make these predictions, but you use quite a few and then see to what extent they overlap. One of my old colleagues, Roland Kint at uh, ECRAF in Nairobi, has developed the Biodiversity R package, uh, for example, which implements such an ensemble of species distribution models. Uh, some quick examples uh, from, from my own work here. Uh, I once tried to uh, map the suitable area for so-called parkland agroforestry in the Sahel, um, for, the, for which I just used the maximum entropy approach back then, the, the max and technique and basically what comes out of this is well we first of all we had uh, well locations of parklands here throughout this whole region here the Sahelian region in Africa and what comes out of such a such an analysis is then usually a suitability a map of suitability scores so every all areas here that are shown in blue are ones that are highly suitable for these parklands and then well the more we go towards red and ultimately black the less suitable an area gets once we have such a model, we can also make predictions for the futures here. For the future, these are, well, some of these old AR4 um, emission scenarios. Uh, remember from that last from the last lecture here, the high emission scenario A2A and then B2A, which is a somewhat lower emission scenario. And for each of them, you can see here, well, first of all, for the baseline conditions for the current climate, you see the um, number of hectares in the Sahel that are highly suitable, suitable, moderately suitable, etc., or unsuitable in the end. And then the same maps basically for the future are shown here below. And while well, we see in this particular case that for, well, virtually all future scenarios, the suitability for parklands actually goes down in this region. Second example here, a bit more sophisticated, we uh, projected here, um, this was a study led by Silas Ranjitkar at, uh, at ECRAF's China office. Uh, he mapped the suitable habitat for tree rhododendron, a natural species in the Himalayas. And in this case, we actually used a ensemble species distribution model with this biodiversity R package that I just mentioned. And what's shown here is this suitability map that come out, comes out of this for the Himalayan region. And what's shown here is not kind of the suitability according to one of these approaches. It's, it's, actu it's actually the number of methods, the number of algorithms that predicted the presence of this tree rhododendron in a particular place. So areas shown in yellow here are ones where almost all the algorithms agreed that tree rhododendron should be, po should be uh, present, whereas the ones where it turns into red and kind of brownish red they're the ones where there's actually quite a bit of disagreement, where it really matters which of these approaches is correct and which ones aren't. So uh, the map shows the number of algorithms that predicted suitability, but yeah, there are large differences. So is the ensemble really the best way to go? Or is maybe one of these methods clearly better than the others and we should only be using that? That's a question that is often very, very difficult to answer. And there's actually, of course, no guarantee that using all of that, that all of these actually produce plausible results. Maybe some of these approaches are just rubbish and we don't know. So sometimes it certainly is, would be worth looking a bit more in detail in, into how plausible these predictions are. So, so statistical models have some serious limitations, however. The statistical relationships may not remain valid. Just because something was correlated in the past doesn't necessarily mean it remains correlated in the future, especially if we've correlated something, for example, to temperatures that are lower than what we're expecting in the future. There's no guarantee that these relationships will, will hold then. We may also be overlooking important factors. Um, maybe something, some biological metric or variable doesn't relate only to temperature, but also to other things that we're not measuring. 
Um, temperature and rainfall are, of course, important for many species, but there's certainly all kinds of other factors that, they, that may be driving system behavior. And if we're not including this, we may be producing models that are simply not very useful. There is a major assumption, especially in species distribution modeling, um, and that is that the, um, the species is currently in equilibrium with the climate. Yeah, so, so basically that the species currently fills the whole range that is climatically suitable for it. For agriculture, this is quite clearly often not the case because crops grow where people plant them. Yeah, not where they would naturally occur. And many of the crops, many of our crops actually thrive very far outside of their natural range. If you think of our cereals, for example, their natural range is probably a relatively uh, small region somewhere in um, the um, near Middle East. Now, they're grown all over the world, even in climates that are completely different from where we, where we would naturally find them. So this is a serious, serious problem. <laughs> and um, yeah, the distribution, the yields, etc. Of, of crops certainly depend on many factors that are not related to the climate alone. And there are always substantial uncertainties in such statistical uh, projections that should be stated explicitly. And quite often they are, that is overlooked and sometimes the, um, well, the conclusions that are drawn are not really justified. Here's a study that I've well, there was developed by some friends of mine, but I still have serious problems with it. Um, there was a press release at some point a few years ago, like West Africa will be too hot for cocoa by 2050. Obviously, a super important crop in this region will be too hot for cocoa. So, um, yeah, so basically this, this crop would disappear by 2050 is what, what's applied here. Well, the model was a species distribution model, of course, yeah? um, with certain issues, um, I don't want to go into detail here, certain technical issues that may, may actually add at least a lot of uncertainty if not making, if, if, if they don't actually make the predictions valid altogether. So um, it is critical when using such methods that we realize that there are limitations, that there are weaknesses, and that we somehow make an effort of, of uh, um, communicating that when we publish our results. Process-based models are another way of projecting the impacts of climate change. These are also often referred to as mechanistic models, and they aim to represent all the major system processes with equations, and then somehow, somehow have a well a model that can be computed. Yeah, basically, you, you put in um, climate data and maybe soil data and other things, and then all kinds of pr processes are simulated that are happening in the ecosystem, in the plant, in the animal, and then we get a quantitative projection of the out, of the performance of the system. They try to capture the best scientific knowledge of all processes that are involved. And examples of these are crop models and hydrology models and phenology models to some extent. Here's just an illustration of what this may look like. Um, this is just some random process-based model that I found an illustration of. You see the climate here, the hydrological cycle, so climate here, hydrological cycle, crop vegetation is here, nitrogen cycle, phosphorus cycle, all kinds of things. And you can imagine within each of these boxes, we have all kinds of detailed representations of processes that we know are happening. Here's an example, again, from my own work. I once used the APSIM crop model for projecting crop yields in East Africa. And, and here it is, basically, you see here a simulation for cotton production at a particular place in Africa on a humic andosol, so, so a soil type that, is, uh, that, is, uh, that occurs there. And we see here cumulative probability of, of, yield, of exceeding certain yield levels, uh, in this case expressed as the percentage of the regional maximum. Uh, for reasons that I'll get to in a second. And basically, you can get here the distribution of, uh, of, of crop yields that are to be expected. In some years, you probably have a fairly low yield and lots of kind of moderate yields. And, uh, well, also a certain small chance of, of pretty high yields also occurs, depending on uh, what exactly the weather deals you. Um, in this case here, what, what's shown is, is data for 
uh, two uh, two of these um, emission scenarios for four points in time, well, 2000 and then three three future points in time for three climate models. So this is a bit of an ensemble here. And you see, well, that these, these cumulative probability curves differ slightly or, well, significantly in some cases uh, across across these models. Now, uh, this is great. What can be done for different soil types and different crops, etc. These are downscale, statistically downscaled climate scenarios that are used here, um, and yeah, we get lots of lots of data out and can draw lots of nice diagrams with it. Um, in hindsight, however, so this is now quite a long time ago that I did this. I don't have a lot of confidence in these results at all. Um, I already didn't have a lot of confidence then, which is why the yield here is not actually given in tons or kilograms or anything, but in percent of the regional maximum that I simulated. And the reason is that these yields here, the, the numbers that came out of the model were actually completely off. They were very, very far away from what, what farmers really achieve in these regions, in this region here in, in East Africa. And um, the reason for this, I'm pretty convinced by now, is that this APSIM is a process-based model. It has a lot of uh, contains a lot of knowledge on the soil and the plant and how it grows and all that stuff. But it doesn't actually include many important factors that limit yield potentials under East African conditions, like the effect of weeds and pests and diseases. They're not very well represented in these models. And so ultimately, even though many processes are well represented in the model, actually the results are pretty far off. So limitations of process-based models are very clearly that the processes are not act actually often are often not sufficiently understood to be modeled in such a um, mechanistic way. And for most complex systems, no models exist, and the development of models may actually be unrealistic because there may be so many processes involved that we can't possibly capture all of them. They would have to be parameterized extensively, so lots of calibration needed and variables like parameters to be defined, um, or they would have to rely on extensive assumptions, uh, which is also not really what, what we would like to do. It's also always possible that models may not be valid in the future, even if we manage to, to validate them very well under current conditions, current CO2 levels, for example. It is possible that well, these they, they may still change their behavior as temperatures increase or rainfall changes or CO2 levels go up. And quite often in process-based models, uncertainties are often not well represented. So you have a complex model that gives you like one precise number well, for the crop yield for a particular place for a particular year. Um, and there's no error bar often. Um, there's, it's unclear really to what extent where we can really be certain about the number that comes out. One thing that I find quite striking is often that we have in these models a certain lack of balance. So we don't actually understand all processes equally well. So a crop model may simulate nutrient uptake very well, but ignore the possibly more important factors like pests and diseases, labor constraints, etc. Which in this case, in the case I just presented to you, made APSIM probably a poor fit for the, Afri for the African smallholder farming realities. Yeah, so on model balance here, um, it is really important in such models and it's, it's actually quite rarely achieved to have an adequate level of detail on all the elements. So um, this is the way I like uh, illustrating that, that situation. Um, you may have seen this barrel before. It's Liebig's barrel. It's usually used to illustrate the concept of essential plant nutrients. So in plant nutrition classes, you may have already come across this. But you can also use it to um, illustrate model usefulness. Model usefulness is the water that's in this barrel. And you see the different staves of the of the barrel here represent different aspects that should be in, included in an agricultural model of plant production. Uh, there's the nutrient uptake, the cultural preferences possibly of the farmer, the land tenure regime, the photosynthesis, and there are all kinds of different aspects. And uh, well, you can tell that if you learn more and more about the nutrient uptake and you make that stave even longer, um, it may not actually increase the usefulness of your model. 
does it have more precision, maybe more data collection effort needed in terms to quantify nutrient uptake precisely, but you actually still don't know how the markets behave, how uh, much demand there'll be for the crop you'll be growing. So the overall performance of the system will not still not be uh, repre will still not be represented by your model. So precision on selected components only does not greatly advance the overall understanding uh, of, your, of the system if you don't actually address your, your real knowledge limitations. There's also a trade-off between complexity and precision. Because with increasing model complexity, the so-called structural errors decrease, but the parameter errors go up. So this has been very nicely illustrated here by uh, Pasura a long time ago. Um, what's shown here is the increasing model complexity on the x-axis and the errors that we're introducing, we can introduce into our model. And what's shown in red here is the structure error. So that basically is the error that results from our, from our model missing important components. Yeah, so the more we add to our model, the more the closer we come to uh, well to the reality of uh, of the system, and so the better the structure actually represents what's really going out going on out there in the world. Now, at the same time, as we're adding things, as we're making the structure more complex, we're also adding lots and lots of parameters, of course, because every every additional model element probably comes with additional input needs so numbers we have to feed our model to, to you know in order for it to run and so all of with all of these estimating each one of them we're adding more errors now each number that that we put in comes with an should come with an error estimate and if we don't make error estimates it may actually be a real error our model actually may get more and more wrong so quite often the a in an infinitely complex model is actually not the best way to go and we should aim for some, a somewhat intermediate complexity level model where um, well according to this concept at least the total error is minimized um, yeah so the processes here may be well represented but there are then too many uncertain parameters and that can also be a serious problem in modeling i know some complex models for example of agroforestry systems where you have tree crop interactions and all kinds of complex complicated things going on that are so complicated uh, so complex and require so much input data that first of all they're almost impossible to run because you don't never have that kind of data and also, in the end, you get numbers out and you really don't know what they mean because the potential for introducing errors with all these numbers and all the default values you've chosen, etc. There's so many, so many things that can go wrong um, that in the end, it's really somewhat unclear what, what, it, what these numbers mean at all. That's why expressing uncertainty is so important. Especially for models of complex systems, we should really estimate our errors. We should not only confront mod well, model output users or possibly decision makers somewhere with the one number we produce, we should always accompany it by an estimate of our errors. And with increasing complexity, that's, this gets increasingly important because the errors can really become pretty enormous. So if you have model, model complexity illustrate here, um, in terms of a climate change analysis, which is what this uh, um, well, overall presentation is about. You have, of course, temperature projections are not so complex. Um, then you can maybe from these projections, you can um, calculate some very clearly defined agroclimatic uh, climatic, uh, met metrics, for example, the chill accumulation, the number of chill portions, or the, 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 um, the number of days above 30 degrees Celsius or whatever it may be. But then you can also move into the biology. You can try and chain to predict changes in biological responses like bloom dates, etc., or possibly pro project changes in yields or other complex metrics. And of course, the more complex this gets, the more uncertainties we really have to add here. And so the importance of providing error estimates really goes up the more we go to over to the yield side. Um, for example, for, for, for yield proje projections in tree crops, for climate change scenarios, I've, I would find that so uncertain 
that I probably wouldn't make such predict predictions predictions at all, at least not before I really figure out how I can properly quantify my uncertainty about uh, about the predictions that I'd make. The last method I want to talk about is climate analog analysis, and that's not very often used uh, out there. And um, I guess for for a while there was a bit of excitement about it, and I was excited about it as well. Um, haven't really heard much about it. it. It has its role in certain places in science, I think. But the idea here is really that uh, for most projected climates for a given location, we can find a place where a similar climate exists today. So basically, we know the climate for Bonn that we're expecting well will be a certain uh, certain level of heat and certain level of rainfall. So let's look for another place that currently exists already and where currently the conditions are the same that we're expecting here in Bonn in the future. So um, here's some diagrams here where, where this is, is basically compared. Uh, what's shown here is the, the current situation for a particular place somewhere in East Africa of uh, well the daily maximum temperature here, for example, and the daily minimum uh, temperature and the mean monthly rainfall. And then in red, we see the for the same place, the projected conditions. Yeah? So this is the future that we're expecting for the particular place we're interested in. Now, the blue line here is from a different place. Yeah? It's, it's, uh, from, it's the current climate of another place. And you can see, because this, this is how it's been selected, um, this is actually pretty close, I mean, not very close for rainfall, but for temperature especially, it's pretty close to the red line. So basically, the, the climate we have there now is very similar to the climate we're expecting at the place that we're currently interested in in the future for a particular scenario. That is our climate analog location. So in theory, the conditions at this climate analog site should give us a glimpse of the future. And possibly it can provide inspiration for adaptation strategies. Because if we visit that other village and we look at how the farmers there manage their agricultural systems, maybe this, is, this could be a model for how we can also adapt to climate changes that are coming our way. So... Um, this is, I believe it belongs to the same data set. Here's, here's an illustration of what that can look like. We have the baseline location here, um, shown by the uh, red dot surrounded by a yellow circle here. This would be the baseline, a place we, we would want to uh, adapt. Yeah? Um, again, somewhere in East Africa, in, uh, well, in Ken Kenya for that matter. And this would be the analog location here. In this case, it's not very far away. But this is a place where, again, for a particular climate scenario, this is uh, a this is this place here is very similar to what we're expecting in the baseline location in the future. An example, um, same general region here: climate analog locations for a village on Mount Elgon in Kenya. Um, this is the baseline location. This is the location of that village, and then all these different symbols here represent climate analog locations once again for an ensemble of climate scenarios a small ensemble so each one of them represents well the most um, similar pixel of of this uh, spatial data set we have here to the projected climate at the baseline location for one particular climate scenario you can see a few clusters here. Many of them are actually very close by because this is a this is a volcano here with a fairly steep slope, uh, and it means and this <clears throat> this um, baseline village is somewhat on the slope, and, and so down in the valley we find places that have well a fairly similar general setting but are slightly warmer um, than the baseline um, location at present. So there's some here, there's some here on the other side of the mountain, probably related to some changes in rainfall as well. Only a few of the scenarios are a bit further away. So, yeah, several climate analog locations are around 10 kilometers downslope, so quite close together. And then we can see, can look at what's going on at these different locations. Well, so many locations that we couldn't really all visit, visit them all. So we analyzed some, some spatial data sets again. Um, and this is this is the um, potential 
um, yield of rain-fed maize. Yeah, so it's a maize growing region, so that's very important to people. And there's a spatial data set of the potential yield of maize uh, in East Africa. And th we sampled this and we don't didn't we looked at the the climate. So so this is the baseline location down here. So the red dot here represents the current the the um the predicted or the um yield potential at that baseline location and then these um the box plot here represents the yield potential at 50 climatically similar locations so places that have a very similar place a similar climate to what we currently have at the baseline um baseline location and so all the other red dots here are climate analog locations for these various climate scenarios that are listed here and for each one again we have this box plot here so these are uh, always the 50 closest pixels to the climate or, or most well yeah the, uh, to the climate analog location so the ones with it with fairly similar climate uh, but still have such a wide distribution of yield potentials this already hints at a problem that we actually uh, well, we try to <laughs> argue that this is a problem here. Um, these places are actually very similar in terms of climate, and yet in terms of yield potential, there's, they are worlds apart. Um, and that basically means that, yes, uh, well, the climate, climate is, of course, an important driver of things like the crop yield, etc., but there are usually different, different factors that should be considered as well in such an analog search. Like the soil type, of course, there may be certain cultural aspects, Certain social economic factors, land tenure regimes, farm sizes, etc., can actually have a major impact also on the yield levels. And it's quite possible, it seems quite possible to me, that in the end, if you wanted to do this well, you would have to incorporate so many factors into finding your perfect analog location that in the end, it becomes uh, the job becomes really unrealistic. So limitations of climate analog an, uh, analysis are, well, many. Um, the analog and baseline sites may not be comparable in important non-climatic respects. And the analog and baseline sites may be too, uh, too similar in non-climatic respects. That's kind of uh, um, another, another aspect, I suppose. So similar, in fact, that you can't learn anything. So maybe this is still the cu same cultural group that does exactly the same things. Um, but we found in this same study that I was just talking about uh, by a master student who visited us in, in, in Nairobi back then, Sven Bose was the first author here. He found that the baseline location up on the hill um, actually had a fairly large farm, it consisted of fairly large farms where people were growing maize and beans and certain cash crops, etc. Um, had some cattle, whereas at the analog location, the situation was quite a bit different. It was just it was just maize and beans, very small farms, um, much fewer cattle, and in general, a very different setting. So it was very difficult to really compare, um, because uh, yeah, and, and learn anything anything in terms of uh, cropping practices from this other place. And this was even um, well more striking maybe in. Uh, in, uh, we also did such a study in in Burundi. So these are two villages in in Burundi. That one one of which is the um, the climate analog of the other place. And yeah, we found we found certain differences here in terms of goats, number of goats, and number of chickens and pigs and cows. But uh, well, this is the percentage of household that have them. But it really is is somewhat unclear what that means. Is this any sort of indication of a an adaptation to anything to climate to the particular climate or is this caused by all kinds of other factors so uh, these studies were really largely inconclusive and it, it seemed to me like <laughs> to be honest it's especially for sourcing adaptation options this uh, climate analog approach was not particularly useful uh, we may also sometimes not have climate data um, because of course you need for such an analysis for such a search for climate analogs we need gridded climate data so we need basically the rainfall and, and and temperature for every pixel of our the larger region we're in and if we wanted to add other factors like the soil type and the socioeconomic setting we would also need a similar data set so a, a um, gridded data set of 
the soil type, particular soil, soil conditions for every pixel of our region. Such things exist, but it really uh, is uh, they're somewhat unreliable. And once you get to more and more complex factors, you'll find less and less data. So it is, it is very challenging to use this, in fact. Yeah, it's usually unclear if the differences that you find, even if you find some, if they are due to the climate, which would make them useful as an idea for adaptation, or if they may be due to other factors and not actually be correlated to what you're interested in. And of course, if you actually want to make observations or, or trials at analog sites, yeah. so if you um, actually want to do something there, do interviews or surveys or whatever, and you want to use that state-of-the-art ensemble approach, then you have to all of a sudden travel to dozens of locations and, and uh, do these analyses. So uh, ensemble studies are, of course, of course, much easier to realize with models um, than with actual field work. I think uh, that is that should be relatively clear. So um, common limitations of all climate impact projection methods, and that's important to know, is that climate data are often scarce or of poor quality, certainly, um, but non-climatic factors are often not considered. This is actually rather important because many, many climate impact projection studies come across as if the climate is the only thing that determines how agricultural systems work. Of course, if you have a projection for the end of the 21st century or even for 2050, you can imagine that probably all kinds of other things will also change by then. It's not just the climate. If you think of the time scales that are involved, end of the century, that's 80 years from now, then let's think back 80 years in 1960, farming was very different and it will, farming will also be very different at the end of the 21st century. So um, these things are also there. And of course, they are even harder to predict than um, what happens to the climate. But uh, well, it, they may still be important. Yeah, so analysts often assume that all non-climatic factors remain the same, however, and that's not normally re realistic. Um, so in some way, many of these studies are somewhat sensitivity analyses. So basically the theoretical question of, well, how, how would these systems behave if everything remained exactly as it is now, just the climate is different? Not very close to reality, but a question that we can answer. So scientists often like, answering questions that they can answer rather than questions that somebody may actually want to ask. So all impact projections obviously are, un are uncertain and all should come with error estimates. Now, um, at some point I, re I explored the um, or compared the different projection methods for complex agroforestry systems because that's what I was interested in for much of my research career. And we wanted to model these and try to compare process-based models and species distribution models and climate analog models. And, uh, well, um, <clears throat> basically, of course, these, these differ in, in what, the, what, they, uh, what they do and how they operate. They require certain preparatory steps. Yeah? For process-based models, you need a detailed characterization and quantification of all the relevant processes. You then have to generalize them into a model run the model for future climate scenarios, and then ultimately get the system performance in the future. For species distribution models, you have to collect information on system occurrence. Where does it exist currently? Um, you have to cover the whole distribution range. Not only, You can't limit this to one country only, for example, um, especially if it's a small country that may experience significant shifts in climate. Um, in particular, you have to sample the areas that currently have the climate that is coming into the area you're interested in, because otherwise you won't know if, uh, if the system or the species can actually uh, survive and thrive under those future conditions. And then you characterize the environmental niche, you make projections of that niche into future climates, and that way you derive the habitat su uh, suitability for an agroforestry system or a species. Climate analog analysis is, well, you first have to identify an analog location. That doesn't require any information on the biology at all. This is just based on climate data. Um, but then it becomes more complicated than you actually have to do trials or observations at the target or analog sites and then infer climate change impacts from the observations or trial results. 
um, it may then be an example of a plausible future land use system, but that is actually very much unclear to what extent that's actually true. Um, all of these methods have advantages and, and challenges. In process-based models, of course, we do need this understanding of the system processes, which we often simply don't have. Um, well, but it's an advantage if we have it, let's put it that way. Um, the advantage is that we can project the performance. Of course, we can actually predict the the yields or whatever in the future, and it can be used in larger scale models. So we could, since we since we're representing the process that's going on, we can possibly use this elsewhere, and we could integrate it into other types of uh, larger scale modeling activities. An advantage of species distribution modeling is that we only need location data. We have quite a few robust methods. And uh, well, we can use these suitability maps that emerge for making recommendations on where certain systems can be implemented. For climate analog analysis, we need no, no prior information at all. We can explore the impacts of climate in a real world context. Yeah? So we can, in some way we can, we can visit the future if we can identify suitable analog locations, which is of course something that the other methods don't provide. They don't provide a walk in future for us to explore. Now, this may facilitate identification of adaptation options. I mean, if this really works. But all of these methods, of course, have challenges. Um, understanding of tree crop interactions is a specific challenge for agroforestry model here. But in general, understanding in detail all the processes that go on is really challenging. It's usually a high data requirement. The model complexity compounds the error sources, so the errors increase with increasing complexity. I talked about that earlier. Um, we have to model all the relevant system components with sufficient accuracy. That's that model balance idea that I introduced. Um, and we often need to temporarily downscale climate projections because process-based models quite often work on an, a daily time step or even a sub-daily time step, and that kind of data is not usually provided by climate models. Or it is, but we first have to find it, and it's not in the, in the places where you usually get climate data. Uh, well, quite often you only find monthly values and not a higher resolution. Species distribution modeling also has its challenges. Also here we quite often don't know where particular systems are are distributed. There's sampling bias so sometimes you you find these uh, well data sets on where a species has been found and the locations are all conspicuously in a straight line that it just happens to be along a road that somebody traveled um, we quite often don't know where which areas have been sampled for a system or for a species and which ones haven't um, sometimes we don't have environmental data at the appropriate resolution which is another challenge here and there may also be subpopulations of a species or of a system with distinct habitat requirements. Um, yeah, so there may be different ecotypes of a particular tree species, for example, and some of them maybe tolerate drought a bit better than others. It's not at all implausible. And well, this this system, this method may not be reliable when dealing with so-called novel climates, with climates that we simply haven't observed yet, but that that will be coming to our region in the future because we can't possibly have observed whether a particular species will um, be able to to tolerate such conditions climate analog analysis also has challenges uh, we have to identify relevant climate metrics for the analog search um, there's often there are often non-climatic factors that are really important for determining how certain systems are shaped and if we omit them um, then they can actually make many analogs useless. So if, for example, we have an entirely cultural groups with to group uh, living in the analog location with totally different traditions and habits, then we may not be able to use much, uh, to learn much. Ensemble methods are very costly, I already mentioned that. Um, and we only really get uh, specific projections here for individual sites. So it's very difficult to transfer the results of this to anywhere else. Whereas a process-based model can then be applied pretty much anywhere else. And analog analysis is really targeted for a particular location. Also, this doesn't really work with novel climates. 
uh, if conditions for predicted for the future don't have a modern day equivalent then uh, there's very little we can do with this method general challenges for all of these methods are that co2 impacts are very difficult to foresee maybe we have a chance of including them into process-based models not in the other methods at all future climates are obviously uncertain and ensemble projections are needed for all methods and it's often very difficult to predict the effects of biot biotic factors like pests and weeds and diseases um, because most modeling approaches sort of ignore those and obviously um, well the, the impacts of these factors kind of differ from year to year there's a randomness some stochasticity that is really difficult to to incorporate in uh, in such modeling frameworks finally i want to give you some thoughts on projecting climate change impacts on complex agricultural systems because of course that is something that we may actually want to do um, especially when you work in agricultural research for development you may be particularly interested in smallholder farmers like a, like uh, the one you're seeing here with his farm here illustrated here this is somewhere in western kenya and this system of course is pretty complex there's all kinds of things going on and we we may need to understand what's going on here and be able to project climate change impacts on this farm in order to support uh, this uh, this farmer properly so there is there is all kinds of uh, kinds of stuff going on here. Uh, we may just be interested in the um, relationship between the weather and the climate and the crops. That's probably something we could do to some extent with these crop models. Uh, unclear how reliable it would be, but it is very clear that these are not the only things that determine um, the outcome of uh, of this farming system for the farmer. All these other factors also affect the performance of the system. We have the livestock here, the trees on the farm, the soil fertility, the way the crops and the livestock and trees are managed. Um, Off-farm activities are important. The markets for inputs and outputs, institutions that are uh, well involved somehow in, in this community here. Um, outcomes that are important are not so much the crop yield, well, also that somehow, but uh, the health and nutrition is, is important, poverty, food security, land health is important. All kinds of things really play a role in such a system, and they, we should somehow incorporate them into any sort of evaluations of system performance. But initially, everything is unknown, and we don't have time or money to study everything. So what can we do here? Where should we focus? What should we study? Weather and climate, yeah, we can probably do this. Maybe we can add a few more factors around the sides. Uh, if we have more time and a bit more money, we can make this a bigger study involving a bunch of uh, little things um, on the side, multiple disciplines. But there's really a lot more still that we're missing. And uh, we should, I mean, as somewhat well-rounded agricultural scientists, we should be aware that there's all kinds of other things involved that we're not not including if we just restrict our study to this these a few components so maybe it's not a bad idea to try and study everything try and still get an idea of the overall system even if we can't actually precisely study everything you see everything here remains a bit blurry and fuzzy maybe we have to find for find a research approach that can look at the system in this way not dig too deep into each of these aspects um, but try and cover everything not invest all the time we have for our phd in only one of these aspects but spread our time time a bit more evenly across all these aspects and learn enough about all of them to actually in the end say something about the overall system so skills that are needed for modeling complex systems, in, in my opinion at least, is that we should be able to build balanced causal models of complex systems. How does everything actually relate? What causes what? And yeah, it should involve everything that really plays a role. We have, find, we have to find ways to deal with imperfect information. Um, sometimes we don't have data for things, or we have data maybe, but we don't really trust it very much. 
We should try and make use of all kinds of knowledge. There's the data, yes, there's the hard data we collect, uh, there's the empirical data, but there's also expert knowledge and there's local knowledge and all of this has value. And probably if we want to understand a system, we're well advised to really look at all of these sources. We should also recognize what we already know. We should not go to a place and pretend like we have learned nothing before and we are completely blank slates when it comes to how agricultural systems work. We should learn how to make forecasts of system outcomes without having perfect information. We have to learn how to honestly communicate our uncertainties and allow for randomness and possibly for multiple perspectives. Maybe different people perceive the system in different ways. And all of this is super, di super difficult, but the challenges aren't unique. They're basically common issues that decision scientists study because these kind of issues are really involved wherever people try and make decisions and try to yeah, choose among options in the face of imperfect information. So how, do, why, how about we look at decision sciences in a bit more detail and, and try and learn from them? What have people actually studying such situations and trying to find ways of making decisions under uncertainty? What have they found out? What methods do they use? And what could we in agriculture maybe learn from these people? But that's not for this module. Here we're talking about tree phenology analysis with R. But if you're interested, if you're curious in this topic and want to learn a bit more about how this can possibly be achieved, I can recommend our summer semester module on decision analysis with foreca and forecasting, where we'll go into the approaches that we are looking into on how to uh, realize such research. Conclusions from today's, conclusions from today's lectures are uh, that to predict, project impacts of climate change, we can use multiple approaches. There are different options. There are statistical models, species distribution models, which are really also statistical. Uh, there are process-based models. There are climate, there's climate analog analysis, which is rarely done, but they may have a place for some things. Mm. And really for new climatic settings, the most promising approach is probably the process-based model. But this is very difficult to develop, especially if you want to have it generally applicable for complex systems Good luck trying to develop one. All approaches have limitations. And it is very important in all approaches that uncertainties are considered and communicated. To some extent, especially in process-based models, because they tend to portray a certain level of precision and accuracy that is simply not always warranted. And uh, there is usually lots of uncertainty that easily gets swept under the rug um, by precise numbers that look very scientific and all, but really don't should not be used in any sort of decision where serious risks are involved. So that's it for today. And that's it's for climate change as well. In the remainder of this class, now we'll finally start looking at tree phenology, we'll start looking at R, and we'll try to apply what we've learned in the climate change lecture to the topic of phenology analysis. And I'm very much looking forward to that. And I'll see you in the lessons on these other topics. Thank you for your attention.